So I'm in an extremely unique and rare position where I've actually used my iPad Pro since 2018 as my main computer. I use it for those intensive tasks like video editing and thumbnail creation, for more personal things like managing the household to even leisure like content consumption, streaming, playing video games and everything in between. But I'd be lying to you if I said everything was just amazing all the time, it was all sunshine and rainbows, because there is a learning curve to the iPad Pro and there is a decent amount of friction going from point A to point B. So in this video I want to bring up three different things that nobody tells you about the iPad Pro, so if you are deciding between something like a MacBook Air and an iPad, this video might be able to steer you in the correct direction. Let's get into it. So now before we jump into this, I do want to caveat by saying that I still love my iPad Pro. This is going to be my main computer right after this video anyway because the versatility of it all. And I've talked about for years why I love the iPad Pro over a MacBook Air. And maybe I'll make a follow-up video because we are coming on 2,000 days of using this thing every single day. But I did just want to shed some light on some of the friction that comes with an iPad Pro, especially when it comes to the hardware to start off. So again, the hardware for the most part, can do everything that you would want it to, right? You have the M4 chip in there, it comes with eight gigs of RAM base, but if you go to the one terabyte version, which is one that I have, you also get 16 gigs of RAM, which in theory should be as powerful and should be able to run everything that something like an M4 MacBook Air can run, or even some MacBook Pros for that matter, because it has the same exact internal specs, you're just running different software, Mac OS versus iPad OS. But even when you compare it in its own product category, right? If you're looking at the iPad Air, the M2 iPad Air can do everything that the M4 iPad Pro can do from a software perspective. It runs the same applications, it has the same type of pencil support, it has the same battery life, it can do all the same things, it runs Stage Manager, it can runs universal control, it has extended monitor support. Well, albeit the hardware differences are there, you know, tandem OLED, 120Hz ProMotion, Thunderbolt 4, the ultra-thin design, that is what you're paying for when it comes to the iPad Pro versus the M2 iPad Air. And now again, we are talking about iPadOS 18. This all could change after WWDC with the rumor of some pro level kind of features coming to the iPad Pro specifically. But right now, the way that it stands, I find it very, very hard to recommend to somebody get the iPad Pro over the iPad Air because the experience when you're talking about software and applications and what it can run and how fast it can run it, it's gonna be pretty much one-to-one -one for the most part. Now, the M2 iPad Air cannot be upgraded to 16 gigs of RAM, but for most people, the way that they use iPads as a supplementary device and not a primary device, the M2 iPad Air is more than enough. So for, you know, $500, which is what the 11-inch M2 iPad Air on Amazon goes for, you can get the same exact experience as a $1,000 version of the iPad Pro, which is twice the price. And I mean, $1,300 of the iPad Pro 13-inch, which is insane because you still have to get the Apple Pencil and the Magic Keyboard. So again, it is overpowered, and what I like to tell people is that you're not really buying more speed, you're buying headroom. So think about it that way. You're kind of future-proofing yourself a little bit more, but for the most part, if you export a LumaFusion file on the M2 iPad Air versus the M4 iPad Pro, they are going to export at relatively the same speed, maybe give or take 5 to 10%, which for most people is not worth five to $800 more compared to the M2 iPad Air. So the next thing that a lot of people don't tell you, again, let's talk about the hardware again with the iPad Pro. Yes, you have the 120Hz ProMotion, the Tandem OLED is amazing. I will say that the display on the iPad Pro, it has zero competition in the marketplace, and I would pay just to have this as a dummy display for most things. But one of the things that makes the iPad Pro a Pro versus the iPad Air is the Thunderbolt port that it has. Well, albeit it does give you much faster transfer speeds, and if you are just a person that has one thing that you have to plug in at all times, then it's going to work out for you. But it's a little bit deceiving as to how it works because A, it isn't a true Thunderbolt 4 port, you're dealing with USB 3.0 speeds, which again, is definitely fast enough as compared to the regular USB 2 controller that you have on the M2 iPad Air. It is roughly about 10x as fast, but you only have one port. So I've been in multiple situations where I need two Thunderbolt ports or two data pass-through ports that has USB-C. So for instance, when I have my external SSD plugged in and I'm in LumaFusion trying to get some stuff done when it comes to editing off the SSD, it works great, but the moment I need to do a voiceover and plug in my microphone via USB-C into the iPad Pro, I actually can't do that. And yes, you can buy a hub and a dongle to split it up, but you're going to want to get one that's a little bit more expensive, so you're adding to the cost because you don't want any kind of rinky-dink $40 adapter. You want ones that can support 
that Thunderbolt speed or the USB 3 controller speeds, which again, like I mentioned, will just add to the additional cost of owning the iPad Pro. And then when it comes to file management and file transfers, things are just a little bit more clunky. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what the macOS version of Finder has versus the iPadOS version of the Files app doesn't have. But most people will tell you, if not everybody will tell you, that they're not the same and that the Files app is objectively inferior to the Finder application on macOS. You only recently were able to format drives up until iPadOS 18. Before that, you couldn't format drives. You can save your actual applications on an SSD and work off those SSDs on macOS versus on iPadOS. You can't do that because it just isn't supported via that Thunderbolt port. So external drive support is just a little bit different. Of course, it's going to work and you're going to be able to do the normal things like transfer and move files around, be able to work off of an SSD with certain applications. But again, the application has to be specific and has to support that kind of stuff like LumaFusion. When it comes to offloading all the tasks onto the SSD or onto an external drive, you really can't do that because everything has to be mostly on the iPad Pro hardware. And again, that's why I ended up going with the one terabyte version because for years, I would get the baseline version of the iPad Pro and then be doing some sort of storage gymnastics to be able to delete stuff, save stuff. What do I need to keep? What can I get rid of? What can I offload? What do I always need on my iPad? And that would always happen with specific applications like the LumaFusions of the world, like the Final Cut Pros of the world, like the Blackmagic cameras of the world because they save so much redundant data on the iPad. So while it technically is a pro level port with Thunderbolt, I would consider this more so of a consumer grade port because again, the, the raw power of transfer speeds is there, but outside of that, it just doesn't really work the way the most pro-level users would want it to work. Again, for the way that I use it, it works fine, but for most people, it's not going to be the solution you want. And now let's talk about iPadOS, which is going to be the final nail in the coffin for most people, especially at this pro-level iPad Pro. I'm not knocking iPads in general, I think iPads have a perfect place for most people in product categories, the iPad entry level, the iPad mini, the M2 iPad Air. These are all great iPads that are great for supplemental work for a lot of people to put in a purse, in a bag, to give to your kids, to use in the house as a kind of research device, as a note-taking machine, and it is very versatile. But again, when you're asking people to spend a thousand, thirteen hundred plus dollars, you can spend almost three thousand dollars on a fully loaded iPad Pro to use iPad OS. And that's what gets people a little bit annoyed that iPad OS isn't worth that money for a lot of people. And while most people say it's kind of a watered down Mac OS or it's too playful, I do want to come down to a couple specific use cases or scenarios that really kind of highlights just where the bottleneck of iPad OS lives. So the first one is going to be background processing and RAM management. It is pretty incredible just how unfortunately bad it could be when it comes to background processing. Stage Manager does help as a weird workaround, but a specific use case is with LumaFusion, right? If I'm using, if I'm not using Stage Manager, if I just have LumaFusion open on my iPad and I'm exporting a file, the moment I leave LumaFusion to go to a different application, that export stops. That export completely stops and I have to start all over again. There is a way to do it with Stage Manager where you leave it open on the side there, but the second you leave that windowed mode to go to another windowed mode, again, it's going to stop exporting. And this happens with multiple applications. Background processes and background tasks that require a lot of RAM will instantly quit itself because by default, the way that iPadOS is structured, it's going to move that RAM over to the front-facing application that the user is using killing those background tasks in the process. Another one is going to be Stage Manager, and Stage Manager has come a long way since its introduction to iPadOS 16. It's a lot more fluid, it's a lot easier to use, but for the most part, especially on device, I don't really use it too often aside from maybe having two applications because for the most part, when you have two applications, I'd rather have it side by side because you have two full on like mini iPad mini versions of the iPad application. So it still has the iPad versions built in there. But then when it comes to stage manager, I guess I do use it on a daily basis for this situation where I have my viewfinder on my iPad. I have my notes on the left hand side and it works well because I'm not killing the background task of something like the Blackmagic camera viewfinder. If I were to leave the Blackmagic viewfinder, it would kill that task and I would not be able to see what I'm doing, which is unfortunate going back to that first piece. And then when it comes to extended monitor support, it's actually one of the highlights of iPadOS and stage manager and how it has evolved because it scales properly, it's very easy to use, you can actually take advantage of a larger display, but for the most part, there's still something a little bit awkward about Stage Manager where I just prefer to have LumaFusion open completely where it takes the entire extended display because having the floating windows, there's something about it that's a little bit more tedious than regular Mac OS, similar to the Files app, where it's hard to pinpoint exactly what that friction is, you just know that it's there and it's something that you don't want to deal with. And then lastly, when it comes to other applications in the App Store, like a Final Cut Pro, like a DaVinci, even like Photoshop and the Adobe Suite, 
they're still kind of watered down. Now they've gotten a lot better and LumaFusion is by far the best one out there when it comes to video editors. Affinity Photo is another alternative to Photoshop that can use Photoshop files. And there are workarounds to a lot of them, but the main applications that most people are used to that are deciding between going Mac or going iPad, that have used Mac apps before and then try to go iPad, the learning curve is too great and the limitations are too much to make people be like, oh, actually it works exactly the same, let me just go with the iPad because unfortunately it doesn't work one to one. There are some differences that you do have to deal with because, because again, iPad apps are touch first interfaces and that's what the apps are built on first and that's why it's a little bit different. So you could slap the magic keyboard on there. You could use the Apple Pencil as some sort of cursor replacement and it does work to an extent, but for most people that friction is too much to warrant the price point of the iPad Pro. So those are some of the things that I really just wanted to shed some light on when it came to the iPad Pro. It breaks my heart to make this video because again, my iPad Pro is my end all be all. I love it in certain situations. I love it in most situations, but again, for most people, it's just not gonna do it, especially at the price point that Apple's asking for the iPad Pro because with the iPad Pro, you're paying for the hardware as opposed to the software experience because the software experience is nearly identical all the way down to the cheapest $300 iPad 11 generation albeit you're missing the Apple intelligence stuff and the RAM management and it's a little less powerful. But again, you're not really buying more function when it comes to getting a more expensive iPad Pro. You're just buying a little bit more headroom. You're buying the ability to do a little bit more, but you're doing the same thing at the end of the day. So that's where the gripe is with the iPad Pro for most people. So I always recommend if you're getting an iPad, go with one that isn't an iPad Pro unless you absolutely need the hardware. And you know who you are if you want to spend that type of money on the iPad Pro. But again, this is before WWDC iPadOS 19 will hopefully change that by giving us some pro-level features. So let me know in the comment down below what you think. Do you think Apple's gonna finally unleash the hardware of the iPad Pro by giving it the software it deserves? Do you think iPad's gonna be stuck in this weird middle ground until you know 10 years from now? Or do you think that everybody should just move over to Mac OS, forget about the iPad Pro, and use it how most people think it's intended to be, which is as a throw around secondary device that's there to supplement your MacBook. But that'll do it for this video, everybody. If you made it to the end, Leave a little dolphin in the comments down below so I know you made it to the end. And leave a comment down below if you're an iPad Pro first user. Always curious to know how many of us are out there. But if you want to watch more videos like this, check out one of these videos right here. Until next time, I'm Fernando. Peace, everybody.